see everybody here in the house of the Lord. And I'm also content because um, my brother, Johnny, his wife, Ariana, and uh, Virginia, right? Yeah. They uh, told me they would be coming, and uh, they, they're here, thank God, right? Um, I hope and pray that the Lord speaks to all of us, not just them, but all of us that are here this morning. Amen? Keep in mind, again, uh, I can't uh, emphasize that enough about the 9-11 uh, families. It's, uh, it's tough. It's tough. Just like so we did a memorial for someone we knew. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was hard to talk there because we knew her. But, uh, you know, we had to do what we had to do. You know, that's what God called us to do. And so we want to swallow our feelings sometimes, our emotions, and, uh, you know, deliver whatever the Lord put in our hearts. Because there are others that were hurting even more. So, you see, it's not easy. It's not easy, um, you know, to let go of somebody. So keep the family in prayer. You know, my praise the Lord. It is too quiet in here. It is. It is too quiet in here. Um, I'm going to wish for prayer for the word. Uh, I'm trying to lean on the structure here. The, the, there was something last week that uh, I left out. One small point in the in last week's message. And when I went home, I always put my stuff together in a folder. And I was going over and I said, oh, Lord, what a point we left out. That would have been awesome. And uh, no sooner than we uh, open up in prayer, we're going to go ahead and just share that. And then we go into today's uh, uh, message. And I'm glad that Sister Jenny said that uh, um, she used the word teaching. Because today's message is like uh, preaching. It's like teaching and preaching at the same time. And uh, I was feeling out of the Lord to say that I want to make sure that we distribute God's word. Just distribute God's word. Because, you know, Chris may like steak, my brother may like chicken, my sister may like pasta. I don't want anybody to leave here and say, yeah, it was all right. I'm still hungry, but it was all right. Because there's going to be enough sense so that you can feed off. If you leave here hungry, it's because you didn't eat. What? And if you didn't eat, it's because you probably wasn't hungry. We need to come hungry to church for God's word. So that we can get touched, moved, filled, and leave here saying, man, we had church. Not that they're nothing about the minister or the pastor. And not, it's, it's God's word. I can come up with a three-piece suit and not preach appropriately like I should and not and, and it won't have an effect. So it ain't the suit, it ain't the cologne, it ain't this, it ain't that. It's, it's God's word that makes the difference. Can I get an amen for someone? Amen. amen. It's, it's God's word that makes the difference. Amen. It's God's word that makes the difference. So that's why I feel led that the Lord is uh, giving me this message today so that we can share it in that way. All right? And let the bits and pieces fall where they may. Amen? And uh, we can Amen. receive it. So, Father God, we pray once again for your word. We ask the continuous anointing and that your word, as I receive it, you allow me now to share it so that they may receive it like I received it, Lord, and maybe even deeper depending on our hunger. And so I pray that you open up these hearts. Minister, Lord. Let your word make the difference in the hearts that receive it. And that today, Father God, we can receive it and know that you are present and that you know that everything that we're going through or facing, just like Sister Jenny said, that you know these things before we even need them or, or know them. You already know them. What a wonderful blessing that is to know that we serve a God that knows everything before we even know it. And so I pray that this word will minister to us, give us strength, lift us up, dear Lord, Lift up our spirit, lift up our courage and our boldness to share it with others that are not here today. 
Remember those that are watching us by virtual, dear Lord, bless them in the name of Jesus. Uh, we ask that you bless those that desire to be here today, but for some reason we're not able to make it. That wherever they are, Father God, they may be ministered to, and let them know that we pray for them, and that God, again, is in charge and in control of all things. Let us not despair, let us not lose faith, let us not lose hope, not as long as we are serving the God of hope and the God of strength and the God of joy and the God of victories. That's who we serve. And so, Father God, let your work fall where it may and do what you sent it to do in each and every one of us. And the church says, Amen. Amen, amen. And amen. So last week, in the aspect of the message we brought last week, we were talking about a little bit about the boxing. And there was a small piece that I left out, and it was that we have to show up in the ring. We know that. The ring is the world. All right? We have to show up because we have to spread the gospel. We have to share the gospel. But even though we show up in the ring and we take our stance and we glove up, the scriptures comforts us in that it says that the battle that we're facing is not ours. It's the Lord's. That is so key. Because that makes you want to show up even, you know, might even get a little more, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if it's a bad word, but you might get a little more cocky in knowing that God is the one who's in charge of that battle and not us. He said the victory is ours. Amen. He goes on to say the victory is ours, but the battle is his. And I was thinking about that and going around and going around it in my head. And I said, wait a minute. If the victory is ours and the battle is his and we still have to step into the ring, you know what we're facing? We're facing a fixed fight. It's already fixed. The victory is ours. The battle is his. All we got to do is act like we know what we're doing. Because he's going to do it all anyway. And that was so important to me. I said, I have to share that because we left out of that street. But it's good to know that he fights our battles. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Because as far as I know, he's not lost one. He's got a perfect record. Mm -hmm. He's not lost one fight. And I don't think he's ready to lose one at all. That's the God that we serve. So we can give him anything and everything, and he'll know what to do with it. Amen. Okay? Don't be despair. Don't let the problem become bigger than you are. Because even though it may feel like he's bigger than you are, he's not bigger than the God that you and I serve. Amen. And he knows everything we're going through, just like Sister Jane was saying earlier. If you will, I want to ask you, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Who has their Bibles? Okay. Um, a friendly gesture with love. Bring your sword. Bring your scriptures. Don't go based on just what I tell you. You're supposed to take it home and confirm it. Verify that what I'm sharing with you is in fact the word of God. If we don't, we can't be misled. And I have a heart for the Lord. I'm not going to mislead you. Okay? But there will be some that may, and maybe not intentionally, but there may be some that could. And so that's why we have the scriptures. All right? And the other thing is, when we're out in the street and we have an opportunity to minister, and the person we're ministering to contradicts what we're saying, if we didn't read it for ourselves, we got it from a third party, you know what's going to happen? Nine out of ten times you're going to say, you know what, maybe you're right. And he can be dead wrong. But because you don't know it for yourself, you can be easily confused or easily uh, convinced of what else is being said and that's got nothing to do with the truth. So you have to get used to carrying the Bible, bringing the church, and, and, and no disrespect, okay, I know we're 
I just, I'm just saying in a friendly gesture, just carry Bibles, read it, study it, because we know when we're working and stuff, we can't carry our Bibles with us, but if we put it in our hearts, can't nobody take it from us. Okay? Put it in your heart. Put it in your heart. So when you're out there and something happens, you're facing something, you need scripture to get you through this. You need scripture to encourage you. You know, when you think you're facing like, like the, 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 a problem that's going to end everything, and then you read something and you learn that God can handle anything, the problem that was like this will become like this. And then you can, you can handle it better with God's guidance in his word. All right? It's really important. It really is important. Okay, so if you have your scriptures, uh, go to chapter 17 in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 17. We're just going to go here to set a little bit of a foundation so that we can run to John chapter 4. Right? But right now, 2 Kings chapter 17. When you have it, say amen. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. Okay. The Bible reads in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 5. The king of Assyria came up through all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. Completely took control of it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Allah and in harbor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. Verse 8 says, And walked in the statues of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children. Listen, these were people that knew the word and knew what God's principles are and when they were invaded and taken out of, as, uh, of Samaria they joined with another nation and knowing the truth they went with what they were being told on what they were believing okay let me finish this then we, then we can sit down and of the kings of Israel which they had made and here it is and the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right before their God. Hope we answer to bless the word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 So here you have Israelites who were well learned and well taught about God's laws. They're in Samaria. And this invasion that took place here, like it tells us in verse 24, and the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Amath and from Sepharvain, I'm glad I wasn't around at these times with these names. <laughs> and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt there in that city. Three times Samaria was invaded. This is the Old Testament now. And I'm only using it as the basis so we can go to the New Testament and John. But three times were they invaded. And the first and second time was warnings of God. The third time they were invaded, it was devastating. Because they were not 
returning to the laws of the God that they serve. And so the Lord sent them a warning, first invasion, shook them up. A second time, a long time later, a second time, right? They said it was for three years. The king there was there for nine years. So almost like every three, every three years. And then, and then the second time, he warned them again. Maybe shook their foundation just to get their attention. Whenever we've been there, whenever we're getting ready to do something that's not right, God sometimes does something that scares us and gets grabs our attention so we can analyze what we're doing. Think about what we're getting ready to do. But they didn't heed to the warnings. And so the third time we were invaded, God said, okay, Assyria, go ahead and take over Samaria. Samaria. Take over the whole thing. Chase all the Jews out of there right now. I'm using the word Jews, but that's what the scripture says. And, 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 and take all the Jews out of there. They want to listen to me. They're going about doing things their way and yada, yada, yada. Get them out of there. He allowed it. Sometimes God, I mean, God doesn't send trouble. But sometimes he, will, he knows everything. He can stop whatever he wants to stop. But sometimes he sees fit to, to let it happen because of the condition that we're in. And so he did that here. And they still didn't heed. So the third time was devastating. Now, the Assyrians came in. You have Judea. You have Galilee. And in between, you have Samaria. They came in, took everybody out, but there's always a remnant that stays behind. A few of those that were there, that were originally from there. And so that's what happened here. And the few that stayed behind mingled and started relationships with the Assyrians, okay? And they were foreigners. And so because of the interracial marriages that took place with the Jews that stayed behind and the Assyrians, the true Jews, as, as a commentator says, they call themselves the true Jews, they were offended that the Jews that stayed behind, and he came out to go get them, but they carried them to complain about them, that the Jews that stayed behind were now having relationships with the Assyrians and, and, and they, they, were, they felt like they were turning their backs on their culture, on their nation, and on the God that they served, even though they were doing things in secret, like the Bible says. I don't know if you know Christians like that. They point out what you do wrong, but they don't talk about the wrong that they do. We have people like that. And here's these Jews now talking about the Jews that stayed behind and all the wrong that they're doing, and yet they were over there out of the land of Samaria because they were doing wrong too. But they ain't talking about that. They're talking about them. And so because of this relationship with the Jews that were in Samaria, now with the Assyrians who took over Samaria, they gave them a name to the Jews that stayed behind and joined with the, the, with the, with the um, Assyrians. They called them Samaritans. That's how the name came about. But the real Jews they want nothing to do with those Jews anymore. They, they cut them off. They want nothing to do with them. They don't even want them talking about the God that they're supposedly serving because they, they, they turn their backs on him. It's what they think. It's what they believe. And so the Jews, now when they travel from Judea to Galilee, a shortcut would be right through Samaria. Or oh, they don't want anything to do with Samaria or the people that are in Samaria. So they take a long way around. When the feast of the Passover come and they got to travel, they go a long way around. They don't come to Samaria no more. Because they don't want nothing to do with these people. They don't even want to come near them. Okay? John chapter 4. Now, John chapter 4, I'm going to try to go step by step, and I know I talk, I'm long winded, but I'll try not to. Paul didn't give me a thumbs up, and I got like a little of five, five minutes or ten minutes left, so we can. Um, so, 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 John chapter 4. This is where we talk about that Samaritan woman that was at the well, where Jesus wound up. We're going to read some now, but I'm just laying it out. Where Jesus 
went to, he felt like he had to go through Samaria. They were on their way from Judea to Galilee. And of course, the, 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 the commentary says it, but it doesn't say here in the scripture that the, 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 the disciples and his father, Lord, it's quicker if we go through here, or, 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 or we can come through here. And he said, no, no, I have to go to Samaria. I must, and I'll read it to you, see how it says it. In verse 1, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. This is in the beginning of the, the Lord's ministry. He just finished doing one or two miracles, plus the one, the first miracle, which is the water turned into wine. So he was fresh in the beginning of his ministry. And he already knew, because when he came here, he came with a plan. There was already a built-in uh, GPS in Jesus. There's no taking him off course. He came with a mission, on a mission. I don't care what you say, what you do, he's going to finish and follow his mission, his father's instructions, okay? And so he knew he was going to face opposition, haters, backbiters, and all this stuff, copycats and all that stuff, right? He knew that. But it wasn't time for him yet. It was too early in his ministry to have a confrontation with these guys. So he knew that they would not, they would not follow him through Samaria when he was leaving Judea to go to Galilee. So he went to Samaria. That was one of the reasons he went, but there was another reason why he went there. We'll get to that, we'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus said, okay, you know, listen, you know what? Yeah, right now, I don't want to talk or get into it, but believe you me, we're, we're going to talk because you're just some of the people that God has been dealing with, and, but it, it's just not time. He didn't want to do anything out of time or out of order. Amen? And so yeah. he continued with his ministry. And then in verse, in verse 3 it says, He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. All right? He went to, from Judea to Galilee. And in verse 4 it says, He must needs. This is King James Version. He must needs. Needs. Anybody has a different verb, uh, edition, another Bible? I want to see what that says. What does that say, Paul? Yeah, he, now he had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Another commentary said that he felt, uh, he, he felt pressed to go through Samaria. Now, I know as Christians, we've been here where we feel the need to do something and we don't know why. And a lot of times it's not for us to know why, but if we find out the why, we may not do what God is telling us to do or go where God is telling us to go. But sometimes it's better we don't know. Just do or say whatever the Lord tells you to do or say. And if he wants you to know something about it, he'll tell you later on. You'll find out later on. It'll come around. But the word that God told you to share it's fulfilled and it's complete. It'll come around if you need to know. It may be a month, a year, or something, and you're going to find out, oh, that's why the Lord led me to go that way that day. I didn't understand it, but I was obeying the Lord. And that's what, and that's what was happening here. He must need to go through Samaria. That's how he felt. So when was the last time we felt like that? To do something for somebody. To say something to somebody. To give something to somebody. Or just help somebody do something. When have we last time, when have we felt like that? Or how long has it been since we felt like that? Remember, that is a way of God letting us know that he's still working through us. So if it's been a long time, you might want to talk to the Lord. Okay? You might want to talk to her. You know, sometimes we go through a dry spell. Not because Jesus left us, but so maybe we took a wrong turn somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we're not feeling as anointed or joyful as we should be, knowing that Jesus is with us. Okay? So this just it's, it's an analysis. That's all we have to do. It's, it's, it's an analysis. And then then coming to him to a city called Samaria. It's Samaria which is called Sikar, 
near to the parcel of the ground that Jacob had, uh, gave to his son Joseph. It belonged to Jacob, the land. And then when, before he passed, he passed it on to Joseph. Now on this land, there was that well. And people came from the towns and the cities, mostly women did this, and, 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 and came to the well and they drew water from the well. Jesus met at this well, and some say, some scriptures say he sat on it, but not a big difference. Some say he sat next to it, some say he sat on the edge of it. No big deal, no big difference. But, but the point is that it was a divine appointment that he was getting ready to fulfill. The, 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 uh, the disciples and all that were following, they didn't understand why we had to cut through here. Remember, Jewish descent, they didn't want anything to do. So, he shows up, and he gets near this well. Now, this well was not a spring-loaded well, where you have water running in the bottom, of it, and there's always water there when you throw the bucket or the pail down. This water, how it accumulated its water was by the dew that created itself through the night and hovered over the well and, and, and loaded it up enough with vapor that it turned into some water. That was one way. The other way that this well obtained water was when it rained and it got through the grass or the dirt and it also went through the bricks of this well and created some water in the bottom of it. Most of the time that people went out there to go and get some water, was it in the day or at night? Those are the best two chances to go. Any other time outside of those two, the chances were very, very slim and close to zero of you obtaining any water. Yet Jesus showed up at this well, right? And the Bible says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sikon, near the parcel of the ground of Jacob, gave, who gave it to his son. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, and I'm glad to use it that he was weary because it proves to us that he was man and he was God. He wasn't half man and half God. He was 100% man and 100% God. There's no half he's here. And I'm glad I said that because there's people still today that say, yeah, you know why he was able to uh, 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 sustain those lashings? It's because he was God. I said, no. God didn't get lashed. It was Jesus that got those lashings. And he was 100% man and 100% God. So to see this word here, worthy, I, I, not, not that I'm happy he was tired, but, but it shows that he is just like us. He was just like us when he was among us. Amen? Amen. And so he was, being, he was weary because of his journey. Okay? He sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now the third hour would be 9 o'clock in the morning. The sixth hour is 12 noon. The ninth hour is 3 p.m. And the twelfth hour would be 6 p.m., by which the Jews count their days and do their fasting, 6 p.m. in the afternoon to the next 6 p.m. in the afternoon the next day. That's true fasting, according to the Jewish laws. All right? And at the, at the sixth hour means that he was there at noontime. At the well, at noontime. Then cometh a woman of Samaria, at what time? Mm -hmm. At noon time. Mm -hmm. A woman from Samaria showed up at the well at noon time. I couldn't wrap this thing around my head. I said, first of all, she was a Samaritan woman. She knew the concept of how the well obtained its water. She was a Samaritan woman. She knew where the well was, which proved that she had been there before. And she should have known, as a Samaritan woman, that the best time to try to get water is in the morning or at night. 
Yet she shows up at noon time in the heat of the day. Noon time, I think to me, when it's summer, is that any time from 12 to 1 or 2, it's, it's hot. It reaches its peak. But here she is at the well. And I said to myself, and I asked myself, I said, if she was a Samaritan woman, she's done this before. What is she doing there at noon time? I can understand Jesus going there because of divine intervention, of divine appointment. Is in God's plans and within his GPS for him to get there. And then she showed up. I couldn't unwrap that. And so, logically speaking, logically thinking, I said, Well, this is the same woman which we'll read where when she was asked by Jesus about her husband, what did she say? She said, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus said, you have said correctly. You, you definitely spoke the truth. Because you only have five husbands, and even the one you have not, they're not yours. Told that to the Samaritan woman. So when Jesus asked her of that, and she was a Samaritan woman, she turned around, she says to Jesus, as a, as a Jew, said, I know you're a Jew because of the clothing that you wear, I can tell. And because the Samaritan, remember the Old Testament, they took it over, now there was foreigners there. And then the real Jews hated every other Jew that stayed behind and got a problem with it, they had nothing to do with them. So she says to him, you, you're talking to me? I mean, I just playing it out, but that's what, that's what it would be if it was done today in 2021. You, you, you're talking to me? You know I'm a Samaritan woman, right? I can tell you, Jew, why are you even talking to me? You and your people don't want anything to do with us in Samaritan, so why are you even talking to me? Why are you asking me for water? And then she says to him, and not only are you asking me for water, but where's your pail? Where's your bucket? Where's your rope? You, you got nothing to the water with. This is a conversation going on with Jesus and, 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 and the woman. Then come up a woman of Samaria to draw the water and Jesus says unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then says the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, is asking me for a drink? Which Obviously, I'm a woman of Samaria. For the Jews who have no dealings to do with Samaritans. So how is this guy talking to me? And then Jesus answered and said unto her. And I didn't even give you the title of the message. The title of the message was, If they only knew. If they only knew. And when I say they only knew, it's the people that are not Christians yet and need to hear the gospel. If they only knew, I pray that the Lord give them hope and hunger to come and know and learn about the scriptures of the Lord. But I also pray that us, as the hands and the eyes and the feet and the mouth of the Lord, would let ourselves be used to take the gospel to them. That's our job. That's our responsibility. They got a hunger for it. But we got to take it to them. He said, if thou knewest the gift of God, who is, what is the gift of God? Salvation. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that is saying to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him anything and he would have given thee living water. If only you recognize who it is that's asking you for water, and you would accept me, because he is Jesus, the Savior of the world. Salvation was a gift from God through Jesus Christ. So now he said, if you know the gift of God, then you will recognize who I am. And then you will know why I'm here. I could have taken a different route, but I came here to see you. 
to talk to you, is what he was trying to tell her. And the woman says unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water that you're talking about? Art thou greater, now she's getting sarcastic, art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and he himself drank from it, and he gave us all to drink, and he gave his animals to drink? You don't even have a bucket, you don't have a rope, you don't have a pail? You can do better than Jacob without all those things? Who, who are you? She didn't know, honestly. She didn't know who she was talking to. And then the Bible says, Art thou greater than, than our father Jacob, which gave us the world and drank thereof himself and his children and his, and his cattle and all his animals? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water that you are pulling out or trying to pull out or come here to pull out shall thirst again. Mm -hmm. You're going to take that water, you're going to drink it, and you'll be back again. And then after that, you'll be back again. And after that, you'll be back again. You are paving on a path here and, and making a trail of your own because nothing's going to change unless you recognize who I am. If they only knew who was talking to them. In this case, her. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give them shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give them shall be in them a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You'll take this water and you'll be back for more. You take the water that I'm offering you and your whole world will be turned inside out and upside down. And you'll find yourself doing things you never thought you'd find yourself doing. You'll find yourself going to places and, and, and you thought you never, you, you never thought you'd be going to. You'll be talking to people and meeting people that you never thought would talk to you, especially in the condition and in the lifestyle that you've got going on. Nobody wants to talk to you. That will all change if you knew who it was that's talking to you right now. He stirred her up with that because she needed a change of her lifestyle. This is why she came at noontime. Because if she came in the morning, she may have run into people that knew about her lifestyle and start talking about her and made her feel out of place or uncomfortable. To drop the bucket and run. So she showed up at noon time. So she has a lower chance of running into people to talk about her, or more so running into any woman whose man she had. Mm -hmm. That's my logical explanation of why she showed up at noon time, because I couldn't find anything else. You got a better one, I want to hear it, because it, it really disturbed me up last night and the day before that. And so that's why she showed up at noon time. And now she gets stirred up by, by, the, by the answer that Jesus said to her. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I should thirst no more, neither have to come back and forth to this well again. Where is this water that you're talking about? And Jesus said unto her, here's the test. Here, here's the test. The Bible tells us when it comes to the scriptures, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. When you talk about the, the word, you don't want to be sharing God's word with just anybody. You want to have to talk to people that are hungry for the word, that will draw their attention. And you can tell when you throw a little bit out there by their reaction whether or not they're ready. If they trash what you told them, then you stop talking to them. The Bible says, do not cast your pearls among pigs. Mm -hmm. When you throw food at the pigs, they come to the thing, they bite it, they spit it out, and then they step all over it. And some people do the same thing with the gospel when you talk to them about the Lord. Oh, yeah, but that's good, but yeah, I know Jesus is good. Oh, yeah, I'm sick and tired of these Christians, man. You know that? The bad talk, the bad talk, the word. 
So you got to be careful who you share the word with. So now Jesus says to her, in this question, he's testing her. He wants to make sure that she's standing on good, fertile ground so she can receive the seed that he's about to drop on her, on her heart. And he says to her like that, he says, Jesus said unto her, go and call thy husband and then come back here to me. And she says, I don't, I don't have a husband. That's the truth. That's what Jesus was looking for. Now she's standing on fertile ground. She's not lying to him. She's hungry. That's an opening for us when we talk to people. We gotta watch for changes. We gotta watch for their behavior. We gotta watch for their expression. So we know whether to keep talking or shut up. But some of us, when we witness, we got them. They're coming in. But we talk so much and we go so deep, we lose them. So the same Holy Spirit that tells you what to say and when to say it is the same Holy Spirit that tells you, okay, that's enough. Don't drown them. If you give a child steak, they're in danger, right? They choke. So you got to treat them like, they, like they're eating baby food. When you come talk to them about the world, I mean about the world, you don't want to get into some deep prophecy and they don't know anything about the Lord, you're going to lose them. If they had any thought about coming to church, I'd rather talk to you, they ain't coming no more. So we got to be careful. And we got to be focused. We got to watch their expressions, their reactions to so when you talk to them about the Lord. You know what to keep going or be quiet. Keep your pearls. And so she, he tests her. And she says to him, and she answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said that you have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now is not thy husband either. In that you have said truthfully. Now he knows he can keep feeding her the word because she's being honest. She's open to it. The woman said unto him, Sir, Remember I said, watch the reactions, watch what they say or the response? Here's the response. She throws up a smoke screen at Jesus. She says to her, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. I'm giving him props, I'm giving him respect. You know, no, you know, keep talking to me. I, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. But then she throws the bomb. And she says, our fathers worship in this mountain, and ye say, as a Jew, that in Jerusalem is the only place where men ought to worship. She threw up a smoke screen to change the conversation. They went from talking about the five husbands that she had to how to worship at the temple. Had nothing to do with what Jesus was talking about. But that's how people do sometimes. When you talk to them about the truth, with the truth, they start squirming when you get too close to their business that they got going on, to their lies, to their trickeries, to their hate, to the traps, to everything they got going on that's against God's rule, God's law. They start squirming now because you're getting too close to the truth. You're getting too close to the things that I have hidden behind me I don't want to talk about that. Do you know that if you want to worship, you got to worship with the temple this way and that way? She changed the whole topic, the conversation. She threw up a smoke screen, thinking that Jesus couldn't see her expression, but he could still hear her. What's the one thing that the Lord tells us to do? He says, be quick to hear and slow to speak. Because in their, all their talking, you're going to get answers. Yeah. And you know which way to go for them. And so, and so, our fathers worship in this mountain, and, and, and he say that in Jerusalem is the place where us men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, I can see Jesus, man, today, 2021. I know where you're going with this. I know what you're trying to do. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll play along with you. You want to talk about worship? Okay, let's talk about worship. And Jesus said, woman, Believe me, I say woman today, I, I, I probably won't get there in a few days. I go and ask my wife, woman, let me hear it. 
So women, believe me, the hour is coming when ye shall neither in this mountain worship or not even at Jerusalem to go and worship by the wall. He answered to her like that. Ye worship ye what ye know not of. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. I'll share that with you in a second. But, but she, was, she was saying to him, listen, the day is going to come when it's not going to matter where you worship. He said, I'm not so concerned with the places that you go to worship. I'm more concerned with the condition of the hearts of the people offering the worship. Amen. That's what Jesus told me. You want to talk about worship? Let's talk about worship. Mm -hmm. I'm going to close it off. And then she said, he says, well, you worship and you don't even know what you're worshiping about. He says, salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. God is not a man that is limited to where he can be. He's a spirit. So you can worship with an open heart anywhere while cutting the grass, using the bathroom, driving the world, coming home, shopping. You can worship. And God be there to receive your worship and praise. Because he's a spirit and he's everywhere. Amen? Amen. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah said that the, 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 the men have said that the Messiah is coming, which is called the Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all these things. She still didn't figure out who it was that was standing and talking in front of him. Jesus said unto her, I that am speaking unto thee and he. If only you knew and you would accept me, I would change your world and life around and make you again a, a person of respect in society because I put you on a different track and get you off this path that you got going on here back and forth, back and forth and only thirsting the next day after you get your first drink of water. I will give you a water that will continue to run in you so much that you want to share, that you want to talk to somebody, that you want to spread the news and use you in ways you never thought that you'd be used. If only she knew. If only they knew. That's up to us. Amen? Amen. That's up to us. Mm -hmm. When you talk to somebody, when you witness to somebody, focus. Don't be on the phone trying to witness to somebody. That's rude. Focus. Look for expressions. Look for changes. Look for the reactions. That's going to tell you whether you should keep talking or maybe do something else. Okay? All right. I, I'm almost long-winded. I'm sorry. There's a whole bunch of details here. We, we can't go into it. We're short on time. But if you